there. All right, all right. Clean language only, people. We're being recorded here. So, um, so uh, real quick, what we had set out to do, you know, as a group, is we realized one of the starting points is we needed to have a common vernacular or definition of privacy, and privacy can be defined in many different ways and and have many different uh, bounds. Um, so, uh, so our first meetings were really around how do, how might we approach that? Uh, really, you know, diverging on, on thinking about this. What are some of the problems that each of us have experienced or are concerned about, both in our professional and personal lives? And then, preliminarily, where do we want to focus? Like, what's really important? Where do we think we can move the ball forward? So that was the first meeting. Second meeting is down to the bottom right here. Uh, we actually do have a ratified definition of privacy, and I'll share that in just a minute. Um, it'll be interesting to get Bob. And maybe some of the new folks impression on that too, uh, but we, we actually think we have a pretty clean definition in draft form at least. Uh, and then we talked about what are the categories that are really important? Like how do we, how would we bucket the different aspects of prior, uh, privacy as we think about them? Um, and which ones do we think are the ones that we need to start addressing the soonest? All important, but where would we prioritize? And so we did um, arrive at the top three areas that this group wanted to tackle. So as you can see where we are today is, is one of the next steps, and uh, as we said, we don't know what we don't know in, in, in the areas of around legislation and um, current landscape there. So we don't want to you know, march off a well-intended and think of a bunch of different solutions to the problems that we see without really understanding current context of this landscape. So this is really integral and, and one of the reasons we're so excited to have this meeting, particular meeting today. So with that, Let's uh, and then from here, you know, and I will we'll need some steeping in this. And then we actually do want to have um, traction and really drive uh, tangible outcomes. So this isn't just interesting discussion, but this is a, you know, um, a precursor to really driving forward some of the solutions. Uh, and as, as Shmuel mentioned, we've already have one startup coming out of some of the ideas of the broader IFPO group. So next slide. So our definition, we have to give props to Axel, we had uh, we had a lot of different words on the slides and working through them, but really got to a very clean definition that folks were happy with. And our, so our definition from an IFPO perspective is, um, uh, as you can see, the privacy is the right to determine the fate of information tied to an individual by that individual. Um, and I'll make two provisos to that. The, the footnotes there is that uh, authentication and authentication that arguably better than today is an important component of this definition to make sure that we don't have imposters claiming an identity. Um, and then, uh, and this is one of our, our areas of focus too, is transparency. So for that individual to even know what's being collected about them by whom and for what purpose. And I think we can all agree there's a, a ton of opportunity there. I'm going to pause there again, particularly for anyone, but but certainly Bob and, and some of the folks that just joined us in this conversation. If you have any any comments around this definition as it stands right now, um, or any ads or whatnot. Um, personally, I like it. It's nice. Uh, it, it it works well with my presentation. <laughs> Well, great, and you're welcome. And that wasn't this wasn't pre-planned, but no, that's 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 great. Um, it's great to hear from an expert that this this holds water. Um, thanks, thanks, Bob. Any anything else from folks? Okay, well, and we can always come back to that, but let's keep it moving. Um, so, just a quick uh, hand wave over the slide. We're not going to go through it, but the eight buckets that this group came up with um, in thinking about privacy were uh, consumer exposure and protections and transparency. And these are kind of actually in somewhat the first four in order of priority after we voted. So exposure, transparency, data appropriation, legislation, which is really key again to all of the understanding all of these in the right context, net neutrality, corporate accountability, the right to anonymity, and then the intention, like what, what's data being used for, particularly if it's being used for nefarious purposes. Um, so that's kind of where we sit right now on that. That's still kind of in draft form. Um, and then just uh, briefly, when we voted across those eight categories of where people wanted to focus the soonest, where we felt the biggest sense of urgency. And these are, these are all very close. There's four of them, but if you look at the numbers, they're all very close, tightly grouped. Uh, but consumer exposure and protections was number one, um, really trying to help the consumer and think about how to protect them. And then that transparency angle, um, you know, how do consumers know what they don't know about how their data is being collected and used? Um, and so data appropriation legislation. So these are where we're focusing first. 
Um, and so with that, well, uh, again, understanding that landscape is key. So I want to introduce our expert, uh, Bob Brown. Bob's a partner and co-chair of uh, the Cybersecurity and Privacy Group at Jeffers, Mangles, Butler, and Mitchell, LLP in Los Angeles. Um, uh, Bob specializes in transactions with an emphasis on data security, privacy, and information technology. Bob's practice includes as, <coughs> sorry, excludes establishment and development of strategies to implement computer software, cloud computing, computer hardware, communications, and e-commerce solutions, designing and implementing privacy and security programs and protocols, as well as remediating security breaches. So I'm sure you have nothing on your plate right now in that, in that camp. Um, Bob also counsels a variety of firms on software development and licensing, franchising, web design and ownership, electronic commerce transactions, and related manners. Um, Bob is also a frequent lecturer as an expert in technology, privacy, and data security issues, and is one of only three attorneys in 2021, a listing of Southern California super lawyers to be recognized uh, for the expertise in technology transactions. Um, Bob is also uh, on the advisory board of the Information Systems and Security Association, Los Angeles chapter, and a member of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. So with that, Bob, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And I'd like to turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I did. You, first of all, thanks very much for letting me hear. I, um, when we see a, um, um, a title like this, you know, Information for the Benefit of Mankind, it strikes me that's, that's almost against my uh, ethical requirements. Um, but uh, it's, it's not a bad thing to work from. So I do have a, uh, a deck which I will attempt to share. I can go there. There we go. And let me put this to the side. And... Hey, 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 Bob, as, as you go and sharing, maybe Nicole can tell us the role of engagement. So because uh, how, how we work here on uh, through this process. Um, Nicole, you want to say something about it? Yeah, if I'm not mistaken this week, we're going to try if you have um, comments throughout the presentation to do a hand raise. This can kind of help us just keep things moving. If if um, you do have in presentations place where you want interaction from the, the group, we can still do the hand raising and I'll call on people as I see them. Um, okay. They'll also go ahead. I'm go sorry. ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say there will also be um, time after your presentation for a Q&A for everyone to kind of just go back and forth and, and have a full discussion. Yeah, that's fine. I'm more than happy to be interrupted during this. It's going to be a lot more interesting if uh, you have questions as we go through. But um, Nicole, if you could, I'll try to keep, I have a list of participants up. If you can, um, if you can keep an eye on it and just jump in and interrupt it. If, I've, if we've missed something or we need to talk, stop. Um, and by the way, I'm more than happy to share the, uh, the deck. Um, there's nothing, um, nothing here that's uh, proprietary or anything. I share it with anyone who wants it. Okay, um, so let's try that. Okay, so um, this is a somewhat truncated version of um, a summary that I give on um, on privacy laws, particularly focusing, not almost exclusively focusing on state privacy laws, because um, the GDPR. I have another pro presentation about that. is a really different animal and continuing to develop. And as you probably know, there's no overriding federal law, so it's really state laws. This is more from being a discussion of the, of the California Consumer Privacy Act to the CCPA plus the Consumer Privacy Rights Act. Now we added Virginia, and now we've added Colorado, and um, you know, we'll continue to uh, continue to do those um, as we move forward. So I'm going to start with the. Uh, let's look, look. Ah, here we are. So the Consumer California Consumer Privacy Rights Act and its subs, uh, the subsequent uh, Act of 2020. Um, for background, it's the first comprehensive uh, consumer privacy law that's been enacted in the United States. Uh, for those of you who don't know the story, it was developed over really just a few days. There's no legislative history. And it, it was developed in response to a proposed uh, California uh, proposition 
which the legislatures and industry and any people like me looked at and said, this is a, this is a disaster. And it, partly because it, took, it did not take into account how e-commerce works, didn't take into account how, the, you know, how, how people really run websites, run their businesses. Um, and therefore, it, uh, it, as if it had been not enacted as a proposition, it would have been probably ineffective, but it would have been very costly. It's not a good combination. Um, the deal that was made, and, and part of that is to understand that in general, when the, the people of California adopt a proposition, it cannot be amended. And most state laws that are adopted, they're amended constantly, uh, or not most, but it needs a lot of work. And something like this, as I'll get to shortly, it's very clear that it needed uh, a lot of work. So um, a number of people, including a former partner of mine who's now a state senator, got together with the uh, proponents of the proposition. They said, hey, if we adopt a law that's pretty much like your proposition, like the proposition, will you withdraw the proposition? They said, yes, they adopted it. And, um, and that's how we got the CCPA. It reflects a trend, and this is what I mentioned, your definition of privacy, I think is most apt, because this is part of really a tipping point in the United States that there's a trend that individuals should have control over their personal information, including control about how it's used, how it's monetized, how it's shared, certainly how it's sold. Um, it is compared to the GDPR. It's uh, very sig significantly different. And one of the things uh, that it did is it prompted a number of subsequent state laws. So um, the, let's see if I'm not, I don't think I'm actually, okay, there we go. Okay, so let me do one thing, let me swap. Um, okay, so for who has to comply with the CCPA? Um, it's any for-profit entity doing business in California, no matter how little, that collects personal information is defined from California consumers. A California consumer is any person in California who's, who's in California at the time. And that the, the entity has to determine the purpose and means of processing personal information. For those of you who are GDPR oriented, that means it basically applies to data controllers. In addition, the entity has to have annual revenues of at least $25 million or more, or collects personal information for 50,000 consumers annually, although because of the CPRA, that's bumping up to 100,000 consumers in, uh, annually in 2023, January 1, 2023, or half of its annual revenue is derived from the sale of personal information. Um, the estimate at the time that the CP, CCPA was adopted was that this would impact at least half a million uh, businesses in the United States. Remembering that the $25 million threshold, at each one of these thresholds is, uh, is gross revenues worldwide. So uh, it, uh, it certainly you know, has a, a far reaching effect. And, like a lot of laws in California, it effectively becomes a national law, all the more so when you talk about something that's you know, internet-based and it's hard to stay out of California. Um, California, the, the law divides personal information under the act into a number of different categories. There are identifiers like name, address, phone Bobby, number. Bobby, if I can ask a quick question. Um, sure. Is, um, how do you define personal information? Because it's all around personal information. What is personal information? So let's take a look at this slide. <laughs> okay, because you get it. So something for basically it's anything that can identify an individual. It's very broad. It's not like in the breach laws, they talk about a name plus something that allows basically allows you to make a financial transaction. But here it includes the basic things like name, address, email, phone, and social security number. It includes a protected classes, race, gender, sexual orientation. It includes records of, that are of commercial information, biometric information, fingerprints, retina, retina scans, face prints, although not necessarily pictures, 
uh, uh, your internet activity, what your browsing history is, or uh, things like that. Geolocation data, which is a hotspot these days. Sensory data, your professional data, you know, uh, my, the fact that I'm a lawyer's personal information. Uh, my the resume that, uh, that Chris read, that's personal information. My education information, I went to Cal undergrad, that's personal. And, and importantly, any inferences from, from those. So if you, what, what is important for most people in this business who collect the information is that they create profiles and they create assumptions based on that information. And so those also, so if you take that information and use it to create additional information, a profile of someone, that itself is personal information. So, so as I said, it's a, a fairly broad scope. Now the CPRA added information that is considered sensitive personal information. And the reason for that is that there's a higher degree of uh, security that has to be and, and additional uh, obligations that are applied to sensitive personal information. And again, I don't really just want to read this off, but basically these are the types of things that can, that, that don't just generally describe something, but describe someone in very much individually or from which you can get more granular information. One thing, for example, is precise geolocation. Precise geolocation is knowing where someone is not just in the city of Los Angeles, but within, I think it's either 1500, I'm blanking 1500 or 2500 feet. Um, considering that you can get geolocation within a few yards, that's not all that precise, but it is something that, um, that gives you much, that gives you much more granular and potentially sensitive data. Genetic data, the actual not, um, and Interestingly, the contents of ma email, mail, and text messages, um, as opposed to just the fact that a mail message was sent. And that's you know, in the news that rock often, it's, e it's fairly easy to get um, information regarding the fact that I may have been emailing to Alex or Chris, but what those emails say, that is sensitive. And then things which you would expect to be, uh, and, and I think most people would consider to be um, sensitive, which are health, sex life, or sexual orientation, that kind of thing. So, um, so Kamal, that, do I see, if, oh, if I may real quick, Kamal, I see you raised your hand again. Do you have another comment or question? No, I, I actually did not, so sorry. Okay, all right. Okay, that's okay. We've got a hand clap from Bill, so we're good okay. to go forward. <laughs> all right, well, don't be shy, don't be shy. Um, so, one of the important things that's under the CCPA and CPRA are your consumer rights. Now, one of them is basically notification rights. Um, a lot of people that I deal with talk, look at me and say, well, I need to comply with the CCPA, so I need you to update my privacy policy. That's fine. Privacy policies are easy, but, unfor but unfortunately for them, fortunately for the rest of us, um, that, that the privacy policy is really the end stage of, um, of, the, of the process. The, private, the privacy policy is pretty key. It, by the way, is the basis for almost all Federal Trade Commission actions that a privacy policy is incorrect or inaccurate, but it has to disclose what personal information is collected, how it's used, with whom it's shared, whether it's sold, and as we move into January 1, 2023, under the CPRA, is it transferred or is it shared in any way? And what the and a description of the consumer's rights, which you know continue to get to, <coughs> and how to exercise them. Um, and one of the most important things is the opt-out for sales of personal information and the ability to opt. And, and for minors, those people between uh, 16 and 18. I think it's 16 and 18, that you can't, that if for them, the ability to sell information, they have to give active uh, prior consent to it, uh, to, the, to sharing the information. Um, um, yes. Before we move on, can I open it up? I think I see Alex has got his hand raised and if ah. anyone else wants to jump in, this might be a good time. 
Uh, hi, thanks, Nicole. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify, because uh, I think it'll color the rest of uh, the impressions from the presentation. So are they, I thought they were going to lower the thresholds to ensnare even more people into complying with this, but it sounds like, Bob, that they're actually raising the thresholds. That, that's, so they've gone in two directions. Um, on the one hand, they've increased the scope in terms of what type of information, and they're also increasing the kinds of rights. Um, and I'll get to, the, to that in a minute, um, of what kind of rights were added in the CPRA and, and things like that. On the other hand, there was a, a big back, backlash by big tech. So for example, one of the things they did is a, they increased the threshold for, for qualifying under the act for companies which would you know, under 25 million and are not primarily in the business of selling or transferring or sharing data, they increased it to 100,000 uh, unique pieces or information about 100,000 unique individuals or, or households. So they sort of went in both directions. Um, and, and it's, uh, I think overall, and, and they made a number of improvements. Um, I will say that I see that George had asked about the definition of the sale of, of personal information sold and asked whether the definition changed and that he attended an IPP conference, which I didn't, where a de uh, Detterman who, um, both are Detterman, I, I, I should say, you know, I have this book here is, uh, both are Detterman is made a nice hit living out of selling privacy law books, um, one of which I have on my desk and it's highly tabbed. Um, anyway, he, uh, he said that sold means any transfer for value. That has always been the definition. Sell under the California Act and as we'll see under the Virginia and Colorado Acts, which I'll talk about more briefly, um, includes any transfer for value, whether or not monetary value. So one of the things that happens, I'll give you an example of one of the things that we look at and have to figure out is that let's say that you have a service provider and the service provider handles personal data. They handle a mailing list or they handle, they, they, they handle you know, a variety of tasks for you. Maybe they do a fulfillment house. They may say, we'll give, if, we, if you let us use your data, use your, your, that, your personal information, email addresses, the people we're sending to, if we can use that, then we'll give you a break. We'll give you a discount. That we would consider to be selling personal information. There's a monetary value to it. So, um, so that's the. Uh, so, it's not that the. What what is going to change is that under the CPRA, we're shifting from sale of data to an even broader concept of the sharing of data, of personal information. So whenever personal information is shared, you can have the ability to opt out or for minors to opt into it. Um, I, I guess I don't, I don't want to uh, bog us down into this question further, but I'd like to put something in the parking lot where we revisit the idea because it seems like we've thought about this as a group where is, is regulating everybody into compliance one of the things that should be on the table? And that's one of the questions I would posit for us to think about. Because uh, we're talking about that as, on the cybersecurity side, do we need mandatory overarching breach disclosure laws and the, uh, the outlawing of ransomware payments, right? So we're thinking this writ large kind of regulatory stuff to solve the issue on the security side. Is there an equivalent of that in privacy that could work? And is that even a good idea? So, but that's well, yeah, and level there, discussion. And I would, I would just say, again, I, I consider the transfer and the sharing of data to be one of the key issues in privacy because I think it's most people don't recognize it or assume that when they give their data to one party, it's not going to show, show it at another party, yet it's done all the time. You know, whether it's because you actively give the information or because the information is passively collected, you know, through cookies and things like that. Um, but um, that is getting to be more and more universal. I mean, we were seeing, uh, I, I had clients who were getting uh, no, do not share requests long before the CCPA. So, um, so in any event, so. Can we, can, we, can, we, Bo, can we look at maybe one example? So it, it maybe can help. I, I mean, at least I have a question with regard to sharing. So 
banks sharing our information with uh, for credit reasons to collect uh, from different banks all information into uh, some credit entity that later is using this information and selling all sorts of services. But regardless of that, uh, they make credit decision based on based on that shared pool of data. Um, is this considered to be sharing my private information or not? Well, I so under the CCPA, it would be except that the CCPA, like other state securities laws, exempts companies that are, are subject to the Graham Leach Bliley Act. And GLB um, is what governs financial institutions and their use of, uh, of data and personal information. Banks are actually pretty good at it. They have banks and uh, I, Bill will say this is wrong. I know because Bill, Bill has a lot of uh, depth in it, but, but health also healthcare is HIPAA, com HIPAA compliant or companies that are required to comply with HIPAA are also exempt from the CCPA. Um, you know, the, it's because of the way privacy and security is regulated in the United States that it's regulated uh, by jurisdiction, but not federal jurisdiction, and it's regulated sectorally. So it's regulated by industry. Um, this would also, you know, I, I think that, I will say personally, look, I'm, I'm on the, I get a lot of calls from individuals who are concerned about their data. And I say, I, I don't work for, generally don't work for individuals. I work for companies and try to help them comply and deal with what happens when they do get a breach, things like that. But if you think about it, um, a company, if you said, uh, if, a, if, a com if a bank did not share payment history with credit rating agencies, then there would be a significant, there would be a significant problem in lending because banks could not otherwise figure out whether someone should or should not get a loan. And it could, it could create, it would, I mean, I understand it really wants to protect that information, but it's more important to find ways to protect that information when it's used for a valid purpose. I mean, well, even in, even in banks, Europe. Banks have been able to lend uh, money to people 50 years ago, okay? And this information was not available. That's one. I, I, I beg, Shmuel, I beg to differ. I've been working with banks for, for 40 years. And at least 40 years ago, there were credit ratings. It was just collected in a different way. The difference now is that it is, you know, that it, it's, a, it's actually, the difference now is it's more visible because you can see your credit rating. It's easier for you to see your credit rating and it's easier for you to object to, uh, to inaccuracies on the credit rating. But, but it's also easier to steal my identity now because those credit rating people have lost myself and Axel's and uh, I don't know, a hundred other million people, all their information uh, was, was taken away from them. And I have no say about it. I cannot go and sue the bank for taking my information and making it public. Well, so let's have a philosophical discussion offline. Okay, um, I'm happy. I mean, I'm happy to discuss it, but I think that you know there's a there's ability to take the position. You know, th this gets into, as I say, a philosophical almost the kind of discussions we have in about politics these days. And I'd rather not. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, so for, I'm sorry, oh. like I, I separate my, a lot of my personal feelings from my from my legal practice. Well, Bob, I, I accept it. I'm, I'm here as a personal, so I, I've just, you know, raised my personal. Um, I, totally, I totally understand. But, but I will down. say, I will say it's, it's always up to someone's individuals. You know, I always tell people that, look, you know, it's there's a personal obligation in this area. And in addition, I would say, look, you know, if you want to get off the grid, the grid, you know, you can get off the grid. So um, in before any, we move on. Sorry, I've, we've got Chris, Bill, and George that have some input they'd like to uh, to put out there. Okay, let's hear it. Yeah, and maybe similar to Alex's parking lot item. One of the things that's come up in this, uh, the security conversation is around the penalties and punitive damages that companies face right now, given the scope of the damage they can actually do, uh, not deliberately, but just through uh, unintentional malfeasance is doesn't seem commensurate. And it feels like in this case too, with privacy 
and kind of a little bit of what Shmuel was asking about, but if you think about Cambridge Analytics and Facebook a few years ago, are the is are there enough penalties, enough teeth today in uh, a company uh, not being uh, good enough stewards of someone's data and maybe sharing that without their uh, inappropriately or without their permission? So I, uh, any initial response to that, but again, maybe that's something we parking lot to say right now that there isn't the table stakes or I mean, or the penalties are really not commensurate with um, the, the damage that's being inflicted to a consumer? Well, I, I, I would say that there are, that the, the whole breach reporting scheme that we have in the U.S., the 52 jurisdictions that are U.S.-based jurisdictions that have 50, maybe 53, that have the that um, have breach disclosure laws. The idea was to shame companies into doing a better job holding onto information, and so with the idea that they would be uh, ultimately punished in the marketplace, because you know the U.S. is for better word, you know we're sort of a uh, neoliberal company co country in some ways. Um, I think that that hasn't worked. I think that the while there are uh, and the fact is that it's difficult to tie. Well, the, the answer is, I think the, the answer to the question is, is should, does it, is it effective to have a punitive system? And with that, and, the, and we have to balance, I'm not talking about the rights of businesses. I'm talking about the, the ability to provide services. I want to say that, for example, on software development um, was the first place I started seeing a serious limitation on liability where a software developer would say, we can't be completely liable. It has to be a cap on our liability. And the reason is that any software developer, um, except maybe the largest, could be simply put out of business by the damages the company would suffer. But, but that's a so, point they have to. I mean, Equifax had a chief information security officer that was a musician. He had no clue what the hell he was doing, right? That company should have gone under because of the fact that they were breached because they were morons all over the, you know, morons at the wheel everywhere. And it didn't. I mean, in fact, everybody got less than a hundred bucks reimbursement and your data was stolen. Your, your digital future is basically in peril. And so they should have been sued out of existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and on the other hand, I haven't seen the data of the exact amount or, or an approximate amount of the monetary disruption caused by that. So, but again, I don't, that's not, you know, that's my areas, that, that's not my area. I'm, I'm a lawyer because, you know, I, I wasn't that as good at math as other, as my brothers were. <laughs> uh, that's why they, they do better things for lawyers. Uh, in any event, so uh, thanks, other questions. Thanks, yeah. who, who else? I think Bill and Irina are up. Yeah, hi Bob. I just first of all, I want to say tough crowd, but I wanted to um, appreciate. Thank you for, for queuing me up to ask a completely self-serving question. You do not have to answer now. You can fit it in at the end of your presentation. I'm wondering if you can chat briefly about the intersection between PI and PHI. And I'm not talking about the HIPAA carve out necessarily, but the definition of PI is different than HIPAA's um, um, handholding with the FTC over PII. And I'm just wondering if you can add anything, any clarification, if there's something you can comment on at some point during the presentation. Thanks. The, the intersection between PI and PII or PI and PHI? PI and PHI. Okay. Um, Let's defer to that, and I'll try to multitask and think about it. While or let's defer for a bit while I think about it. I think that the, you know, PHI is is something that is more is is getting to be addressed under state laws more and more. But I think that the decision at most on a legislative basis has been that that the states should not get involved where there is already a, a privacy regime. And that's why they would accept out HIPAA and uh, financial institutions. Um, but it certainly, at the same time, all this information is, you know, it, it is essentially, it, it ends up being subject, it, it ends up being um, sensitive personal information under most state laws. So I don't know how, how close that is to being responsive. But um, Irina, you had a question or a comment? 
Um, you're muted, Marina. I'm sorry, I apologize for that. Uh, my question is, of course, from consumer side. Um, I am looking at consumer rights and I am thinking, okay, how do I know that my rights were violated either by uh, disclosure or by uh, whatever accident uh, before something drastic happens to me? How do I know that my information was stolen before my identity is stolen? Well, your information was stolen before your identity was stolen because that's how they steal your identity is by stealing information. I, I understand that, that. but I, the point I here. The, yeah, I, I think the challenge is this. Um, we're dealing, I have a whole nother deck about this, but we're dealing in, in a world where, the, where the, the bad actors, and, and let me say that I, you know, I understand that this is you know, very clear, this is, this is a you know, very consumer, very rights oriented group, but you know, the bad actors who are in this field are extremely sophisticated. And one of the things we've seen over the past year, year and a half and two years or so, is an immense increase in their ability to, to invade systems, to dwell in systems, to exfiltrate data, and to do so unnoticed. Um, the systems that we use were not designed to, for, with security in mind. All the systems we use, the internet and things that go out, but very few systems other than very private systems were designed to promote access. Everything that we do to protect is some kind of bolt-on to that system. Um, it is difficult to create, it's difficult if not impossible to create a system which cannot be breached. Um, there are a lot of things that companies can and should do. Uh, companies should create better visibility into their system. They should have better endpoint protection. They should, their network should be uh, constructed with better segmentation. There are a lot of things that they should do. But the type of tools that the bad actors are using include um, things that make it that they, basically tidy, they're very quiet and tidy up after themselves, very hard to find this. So in terms of, um, you, you know, it, it's sort of, I, I take the position that anytime there's a breach, it's not that there is one victim, which is the party who's, who's in, is the, the consumer or the individual. There are multiple victims and one of them is the company because we felt even companies that have what we consider to be very mature systems have been breached. I mean, you know, it's, it's not, I don't consider PCI DSS a particularly good system. It's, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot of stuff to do, but every major credit card breach has involved a, have involved companies that are PCI DSS compliant. Um, in terms of your, the rights, individuals as, you know, we're getting into, but I don't think we will actually have the right to know, to demand to know what it's collected, how it's used, with whom it's shared, whether it's sold. They have the right to require it to be deleted with certain exceptions so that businesses can fulfill consumer requests or comply with law and things like that. There, you know, those are rights which are, which have been granted and you can control. But if you're saying that your right is your, your right is to prevent your information from being is your right is to have your information not stolen, well, that's you know that's that's all that's is a right, but it's sort of like having someone break into your car or into your house. Right, but it's still, I mean, it, it's still going to happen. Bob, there's there's a fairly fundamental difference. So let's say the Kaseya and the, the solar winds attack, I totally agree. Those were sophisticated nation state guys. There's no question about that, right? 
We're still trying to figure out how the hell they did it. Believe me, I've been spending a lot of resources on this, a lot. And uh, so those are very hard to discourage, no doubt about that. But the Equifax hack was trivial. I mean, they left the front door open, they left the back door open, they left everything open, right? So that's why I'm saying there is a ginormous difference in whether you got attacked by a nation state player and then they cracked it and they got in, or whether you were just hiring people who were incompetent and you were asleep at the wheel while the entire operation ran. And those people were the ones that had the most critical, crucial, and sensitive information about anybody and everybody. There's a huge difference between those. Well, I'm not going to do another autopsy of, or, you know, of, of Equifax. Um, because my position would be that what we we're looking at is that the tools that are imposed by nation state actors have migrated to the private sector. Now, I deal with a lot of companies and we deal with breaches and we deal with breaches ranging from people who clearly did, you know, clearly did not do the stuff that you, that, that are obvious things to do. They didn't have multifactual authentication. They left open ports. They uh, did not update their virus signatures, you know, things like that. But, you know, we deal with both. Um, if the idea is that you want to put, you, you want to have a, uh, and, and, you know, and one, listen, one of the things we'll get that we won't get to, um, because I think I'm done, actually done with my time, is that um, the newer laws that we're seeing, Colorado and Virginia, require regular security assessments and failure to, and, and to report those assessments to a central source. So that that information, if uh, is becomes available, and um, and starts and will and hopefully will encourage people to actually have adequate security. But um, I'm just also aware that there is, you know, you could have the best stuff in the world, and somebody can make a mistake. Um, somebody laptop gets stolen, and so on. So I I, I understand your frustration. Uh, with these, I get pretty frustrated. I get frustrated with my clients who can't seem to get it, can't seem to get it straight. But I don't think uh, I also don't. Well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to get a, get onto any into a higher horse than I've already climbed onto. So, hey Bob, it's it's Chris here, just from a time check. So we're we're good. I mean, we, we can do another twenty minutes. And I don't. I know you encourage this all, and and uh, this is not a shy group. Um, I don't know how much more you wanted to get through and if we should kind of do more, uh, we can do chat window questions so you can get through the rest. If that's, you think that's better just kind of gauging the pace here or um, we can continue on the way we've, we've been doing. So depending on your preference. Um, you know, I, I don't mind, listen, um, you know, I, I've, I've no problem with, with however we want to do it. I can sort of uh, jump through and I'm trying to figure out which gotten you know a third of the way through my slides um let me try to speed it up a little bit and then we can get to some more of the interesting uh interesting questions um although let me say that from arena said how can a consumer verify that his or her or their information is not shared um that's what these laws about to find out because now you have the right to ask um, any company with whom you do business. And you also have the right to prevent that. There actually is now uh, a, 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 one of the new tools is a company that's created a global, basically global button, which will automatically send a notice to every company at every website you visit with that they can't share your information. So that's, uh, there actually are some of those tools. Um, let me just hit a couple of things more on the California law that might be of interest or importance. One of them is not so much the CPPA. They rejected my application, but I probably was happy with practicing law anyway. Um, but there are a couple of principles that are adopted, and these are really through the GDPR. But when I talk to my clients, these are the things that I emphasize, that there are that you need to, first of all, limit the amount of data to collect. 
companies, and I think everyone here would agree companies collect. It's one thing when co companies collect information because they need it to, so to provide the services or they need it to, uh, they need it because for the reasons they tell you and that there's a valid reason. But anything more than the minimum is unnecessary and just create. And if speaking on it as a company lawyer, it, collecting anything more than the minimum simply creates uh, liability for the company and creates problems for the consumer. And then there's a purpose limitation that you collect it for a specific purpose and not for any other purpose. If you're collecting the information for the purpose, uh, if Amazon collects my um, my address for the purpose of sending me a package, they shouldn't be able to use it for any other purpose without my prior consent. And then a storage limitation because people tend to hold on to information forever, which is another big issue. Because if we hold on to information too long, that creates uh, that creates uh, liability and creates uh, you know problems for everybody. Those those three things alone would reduce the amount of data theft and the you know the pain that we feel in society. Um, there are a few new rights and these things are, th this is where we're going. It's the right to correction, to make sure your information is correct. I think one of the most important things is automated decision-making technology. That's sort of the inferences that when companies use an automated system to determine your characteristics, determine what to do and, and start using that information to be able to opt out of it. Again, limiting the ability of a company to use your information for only specific purposes is an important right. Um, and then uh, the right to restrict sensitive information, uh, which we talked about, that's simply an extension of the limitations on personal information. And then there's the new consent standard. Um, consent cannot be, consent has to be explicit that you can't accidentally give your information away. You can't, um, you can't give your, it's the difference between opting in and opting out. And, the, and so when, you, when a company collects this information, they now are gonna have to be explicit about what, uh, to make sure that they, the, it's gonna be at their risk if they collect information without the, without the consumer or the provider of information actually understanding what they've agreed to. Uh, so, uh, Nathan, I see your comment. I, 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 I feel your pain. Obviously, my my comment was a little bit sort of snarky, which is that, insofar as um, there are there there are you know really bad people and the ones that do ransomware. So, so that's a category. There's the other category that Axel referred to who are maybe labeled as incompetent or negligent. I, the, the, the area I've personally experienced, which is not relevant to this conversation, but also worry about most is where you have corporations who are US corporations, legit businesses, all of whom we love, that love the brands and so on, and yet are pushing the edges where you know, a year later, we're surprised. Oh gosh, really? Did they did that? How is? And it's like, how does one influence those? So, so part of my topic was, do we give them a label? And then, how do we deal with that behavior? Well, listen, I I, I don't know. You know, I, I I think there's it's it's a good question. Um, there. Uh, it's a, it's a good question, and I think that the tendency in the U.S. has been to uh, try to find ways for the market to to do it. Because, and, and I, I will tell you, I just I can't. Whether you're a Democrat, Republican, whether you're progressive or whatever you might be, I don't think there's a lot of interest in having the government um, start to uh, put to the government say to the government get involved on a grand, granular level on that. Um, and Alex had a lot of good comments. Um, Irina, I, 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 the, your question about how do you exercise these rights, every website that you deal with has that in California that falls under the, the act that meets one of the threshold requirements has a has to have at least two means of contacting the company, one of which has to be an 800 number. 
or uh, typically what we recommend is a uh, is a, an online uh, is an online uh, request form. It has to be answered within 15. It has to be re, re, uh, it has to be acknowledged within 15 days, acted on within uh, 45 days, and we usually try to tell our clients to do a lot faster than that if they possibly can. But it's on the website. You can check it. It has to be in the privacy policy. And any company that sells personal information in California has to have on their the front of their website a, 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 a link that says, do not sell my personal data, do not sell my personal information. Mm -hmm. And that'll go to uh, change, do not, trend, do not share my personal information. Um, I don't, I, these are the things on this slide are, are pretty grand or not really necessary. Um, I do hear, by the way, um, is response to the question about selling personal information, any transfer for monetary or other valuable consideration. So it specifically includes not monetary uh, consideration. Um, the sharing is something that you should all be more interested in because it's not sharing is I think where a lot of the uh, issues come into play because um, you know, using sharing information for, as they say, co cross context behavioral advertising, that's something that we start opening up a real hornet's nest because that's the type of thing where uh, people start, where you start getting things you shouldn't get. And frankly, I think that's an area where there's a high possibility of, um, uh, there's a high possibility of, uh, of uh, a higher possibility of personal information theft. Um, because more information that's out there, even if it's anonymized, even if it's, um, uh, it, even if it's not, not technically personal information, give me enough non-personal information about a subject and we can turn it into personal information. Um, Axel, um, <laughs> we, we've actually, I've actually dealt with uh, GDPR, um, GDPR, uh, uh, breaches, um, they got the same problems we do. <laughs> you know, um, they're they're not it, 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 they, you know, they have better coffee than we do, but they don't necessarily have better systems. Um, the law is is pretty tough, um, and it's, it's very hard to comply with. But, um, a lot of my clients simply don't do business in Europe for that reason. It's not, um, it's not only that the the fines are higher. The the issue is more you have to have a person with a commensurate education fulfilling the job as a CSI, a CISA yeah. role, right? Yeah. You can't I can't have and, a musician being your chief information security officer. That well, I wouldn't, yeah, I, I wouldn't, since the musicians I know are pretty good at math, I, I tend to, and, and uh, I, know, I know several <laughs> uh, good people who have PhDs and they, they seem to be pretty chatty. Look, I, I'm an English major. You know? so, and somehow, uh, you know, I, I don't have a degree in engineering. Um, I think that I, I would say that it take, you know, I do say that it takes training and anytime we do, I, I do a lot of questions. We try to analyze the, the security maturity, cyber maturity of a company and a lot of the questions who is handling it. And I'd be just as concerned if it were a CFO without this kind of background as anyone else. Um, I would say one of the problems is that the professionals in this area tend to make it, tend to create uh, bars to entry and make it much more difficult to uh, much more difficult. Um, in terms of, in terms of, of enforcing it, really enforcing it, there are two levels in which the California laws are, are enforced. One of them is governmental enforcement where, and this is a broad enforcement, right? The AG and then in the future, the CPPA can seek violate uh, 2,500 dollars per violation. If it's negligent, 7,500. If it's intentional, it's well enough to put anybody out of business who doesn't comply. At this point, they do not have, and it's unclear whether the CPPA is going to have significant, um, significant resources to do this. Um, I think the last estimate they had for 2021 was the Attorney General had enough to cover four cases. They've been going after low hanging fruit and trying to, and, and really you know, looking for really egregious cases. Um, but there's a limitation what they can do. Um, the private rights of action, um, 
there ha the, the thing is that depends on there being a breach. So simply not complying with the law doesn't give you the right to bring an action. Um, what we really found that the CCPA does is it's been used as a lever for other claims. I have only seen one or two cases um, that out of the 75 or 100 I've seen over the last year where a claim has been brought purely under the CCPA and those were bogus cases because I know the lawyers who did them. Um, I want to go briefly, I think it's important to look, understand that we now have two other laws, which these all are effectively, um, effectively nationwide laws. There's the Virginia Data Protect, Consumer Data Protection Act. Um, it also, it, it, notably, it does not have a dollar threshold. It has a question of whether it, how many consumers uh, they process data and whether, and if they have 20, 100,000 more consumers or 25,000 or more, and they derive more than 50% of the revenue from the sale of personal data, um, that's actually a lot of, that, that would cover a lot of, a lot of entities, but there's no threshold. You know, you can be, you, you can have, uh, you, you can have no income and still be subject to this act. Um, it does adopt the GDPR concept of controllers and processors. For those of you who try to figure out where someone is a controller or a processor or both, that's sort of good and bad because the definitions are there, but they're, they're not all that helpful. They, like California, have notice and consent provisions, and there is no private right of action. And it's uh, the Virginia uh, Attorney General has exclusive enforcement rights over this with penalties of 7,500 per incident. Um, they have a couple of things that are a little bit different. They, they do include the data minimization, as I said, which I consider to be very important, very protective of consumers. They include a right to appeal so that if a, they're, because just because you ask for information to be provided or for it to be deleted, there are a variety of reasons why a controller would not have to um, have to honor that request, but they have a right of appeal. Um, and then that way that uh, that way you, you, there's a, another level of protection for consumers. And, um, and as I said, they have data protection assessments. And that again, is something that isn't in the California law, but frankly, it's the kind of thing that we, that we do, but it covers things like targeted advertising, sale of data, profiling, how they handle sensitive data and, and other things that present a, what they call a heightened risk of harm to consumers. So the, the, and the Virginia law is getting to be more of a model. Um, it also makes it clear that there's no way that you can waive that, it overrides any contract. It prevents, it has a purpose limitation, which are, as you can see, it's similar to what I talked about before, that you can only use the data for um, purposes that are, at least reasonably necessary for uh, the reason for, for you, that match up you know, the data and the, and the use has to match up. And there's a positive requirement to maintain reasonable security, administrative, technical, and physical data security. What reasonable data security means is up in the air. Maybe you guys will get to that. Um, I think that's a good question on the data security side. Um, Last week, I think it was, maybe the week before, Colorado signed into law their Privacy Act. It's closer to, Cal to uh, Virginia's than California's. As you can see, the definitions are similar. It uses a lot of the same concepts, exclusive enforcement by the Attorney General, and it provides, uses the you know, GDPR type terminology. Um, it includes similar rights to California. Um, uh, it also requires, this is interesting, requires consumers to use an authorized agent for, to have to use an opt-out, a sale opt-out request. I have not dug into why they're doing that. Um, so I can't tell you why they did that. And it also includes this universal opt-out request. Um, the California law says that if someone has, that they're, California law is unclear as to whether you can use a general opt-out request. And, and by the way, I will get you when I'm off the, I have the, this global tool 
I can uh, I can send it to you as soon as I get off this, uh, this these screens. But they allow for global opt out, uh, opt out requests, which if actually implemented nationwide would uh, would be a benefit. And it also includes a, an appeal process. Um, they require data protection assessments, as I mentioned. They have an opt-in instead of an opt-out for processing sensitive information like racial or ethnic, uh, health, health, biometric data, things like that. And um, they have a cure right for violations, which is a full 60 days. Um, but that is repealed as of January 1, 2025. And I will say that I read today that the California governor, the Colorado governor has already said that uh, they're gonna be amending this law. So uh, there's gonna be a lot more done to this law before I, uh, we, we get to it. Last thing I'd say is what's gonna happen. Well, Congress is gonna consider, it has a lot of federal privacy legislation. Each session, it seems to get a little bit further, a little bit further, never quite, quite gets there. Um, I have limited belief in the ability of the federal government to do virtually anything, um, except maybe, you know, uh, give name post office offices, things like that. Uh, there are other things they can do. The recent executive order, the one that followed the solar winds, is something actually very important because one of the problems in this area is people don't share information about breaches. And so, um, so having a universal understanding about how these breaches are occurring is gonna make it a lot easier and a lot more effective for companies to prepare for them. I mean, sharing this information is very important and this helps fill that void. You can expect the FTC and state attorney generals to expand their activities. Again, there's a big void here. The FTC is somewhat limited, but they're talking about expanding their authority. Um, it's probably more likely that if there's a, if there's a federal uh, agency would be the FTC, since this is a consumer, primarily consumer issue. Although most of the breaches we deal with tend to be up higher up in the, in the supply chain. A lot of states, there are eight states that uh, considered but did not adopt privacy legislation. Um, you know, more states adopting privacy legislation, it might be good, but it's mainly going to be good for lawyers. And if it's good for lawyers, it's bad for everyone else. Um, the reason I say that, it's just going to create confusion, and it's going to make it harder and harder for companies to actually, companies are going to spend more of their time on compliance than they are going to spend on actual security. And I would rather, as I tell my clients, you're better off focusing on actual security, because if you have actual security, compliance isn't too bad. Most companies I deal with don't actually have a good handle on where their data is. And if you don't have a handle on where your data is and who use, who's using it, you know, where you're gonna go. And then I think that we're going to see legislation targeting very specific issues. Um, New York just adopted a biometrics law, which is similar to, Chicago, to Illinois' one. Illinois has a biometric law, which has gotten a ton of, of press and a lot of activity. Um, and uh, there was just another case today where Hyatt uh, settled a violation of that law for one and a half million dollars because they were using a fingerprint scan to check people into their, um, uh, to, to, as time cards, but they, uh, but they didn't get, give the proper notice and, and disclosures. So I think things involving biometrics, geolocation, and sensitive, certain sensitive information, I think those are likely to get some, uh, some uh, reasonable amount of, um, of, uh, of play. Anyway, um, I'm not even gonna show you my picture because you guys can see me if you want. I'll stop sharing and you guys can, you can chat. You know, actually Thank there are two reorganizations that are um, end of the meeting in about seven minutes. So um, um, Chris, you wanted to say a few things and uh, lots of people with questions. Uh, yeah. Hopefully you raise all your questions or ideas or thoughts in the chat because we will revisit that. But uh, let's, yeah. Chris, it's all your Yeah, time. yeah, uh, Bob, I had to show, show superhuman self-control and not asking you like a million questions when you're going through this and are jotting them down. Oh, I I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I suspect I'm not the only one on this call, though you answered so many questions. 
what I'd recommend is for folks who we didn't get to a topic or you have a question sitting in your mind, um, if they're in the chat, great, we'll harvest those. Or I'll put my, send my email out. I'll, I'll collect what we didn't get to um, and organize those. So maybe, you know, Bob, not to conscribe you to a second conversation, although you would be certainly welcome, but certainly if even a smaller group of us could sit down and get answers to um, some of those questions. Uh, and, you know, I, I, um, we're starting to formulate. So our, our first two priorities, again, are on consumer exposure and, and how can we better protect customers and give them control back is one of the areas. And then just, uh, and I think Irina asked it and a few others around transparency, how do we help create more visibility into, uh, for the typical consumer and what's being shared about them? So um, we're formulating kind of the substrates of where we'd want to focus on that. Um, so, um, so we're going to do some work around putting the structure there. Uh, we've had a few folks volunteer who are interested in those first two topics, again, consumer exposure and transparency. So if you're interested in helping formulate where we want to go on those two topics next, please contact me directly. Uh, again, uh, please send any follow-on questions we didn't get to. Uh, and, and Bob, you covered so much in such a short period of time. So thank you for that. Um, I think uh, I'll speak for myself level of knowledge probably tripled in this area in just 90 minutes. Um, uh, but, but certainly there's some areas that we're gonna need to go deeper in, and maybe we can talk about um, if, we, if we can work on that together. Um, so uh, I, Shmuel, I think that's it for this particular meeting and then we'll talk about our next meeting and we'll definitely be coming back to the broader group and a regular cadence on the privacy topics that we're discussing today. Okay, so again, Bob, this this was an awesome presentation. I mean, I enjoyed it. I have tons of questions that I didn't raise. Um, I started with one very personal, but there are others, but uh, I've learned a lot uh, from this presentation. Um, I don't know how, how other people feel, but I've learned a few things that definitely I didn't know. And I'm, I'm actually very proud of California and um, other places who are trying to kind of like legislate privacy to some extent and give us some hope uh, from that aspect. Um, yet um, I also see tons of opportunities uh, for technology and for companies to help us um, monitor that and handle it um, in a more um, in the background and, and help us resolve issues. Um, I personally have lots of other things that may, may have not have been covered in the presentation and not being covered by the legislative um, uh, to the way that I would want it, but it was wonderful. So thank you very much for that. Um, second, um, next meetings. So um, we have uh, two trends here. We are talking about security um, and um, about privacy. And I thought our next meeting is gonna be about security. Um, Alex, um, you wanna say something about what your thoughts, uh, next step of uh, where we are on, sec on the security side? Alex, thank you. Uh, yeah, is security the next uh, topic? Yeah, did I just get voluntold that we're doing security again? <laughs> well, we, we, we have, we're already jumping between the privacy and security. We can do privacy, you know, yeah. next month. I'm, I'm good with that too because well, a lot to do there, you know. Yeah. What? Well, let, let's discuss during our uh, our recap meeting uh, tomorrow because uh, honestly, the the pri the security landscape is moving really quickly. And I don't want to fall into a mode where we're reacting to each new breach just out of sensationalism, and it's you know fun fun to talk yeah. about. But uh, what I what we, just to catch everybody up, and I'd love people's involvement and ideas around this. We have a rubric from uh, Harvard Business School that they use for ideating for uh, startup ideas and things of that sort. It's a, where you fill out stakeholders and influences and motivations of things that are stakeholders in an ecosystem. We are looking at stakeholders around cybersecurity, everything from consumers to governing bodies to vendors and uh, people that work in cybersecurity, uh, businesses, nonprofits, et cetera. And we, we found some fascinating trends, but we're having a hard time getting through the rubric because we just get into a really deep discussion about various, almost philosophical, like Bob said, questions around some of the stuff. What are people's motivations and intentions around security? And some of them are counterintuitive, like law enforcement and vendors. And, who, you know, what are their intentions and motivations? Why are, you know, around cybersecurity? And that's kind of where we stop. So if there is interest to pick up that, uh, you know, and, and get through that rubric and follow that methodology, I think it would serve us really well. So if we were to be able to, be able to do that. So, 
I will probably put a an email out to the group uh, and and kind of uh, go that way, right, and get feedback from people as to what they want to do in a month. Alex, thank you. Um, that's awesome. With regard to privacy, um, uh, through our uh, last two meetings, previous meetings before this meeting, um, we did cover a lot about, um, you know, who are the players, uh, what are the interests and so forth. And we do have some follow-ups. So some uh, areas of further or deeper explorations uh, that are coming soon. So um, we'll definitely discuss those and, and, and um, uh, we might, we can do, you know, again, we can jump into privacy and, uh, and, and follow up from there. One other thing that I have with regard to privacy is um, I got a connection um, just through, you know, networking in the last, um, in the last three weeks um, with people in Germany who are very much involved in what's happening in Europe with regards to privacy and uh, some uh, legislative and other um, activities happening actually in Germany. Uh, for, um, on, on the subject. And I wonder if we want to uh, maybe get a little bit more information about what what's, what's going on in Europe and how things are playing there on the privacy side. So I'll definitely try, um, I'll, I'll try to bring it up and see if, um, if I can get some traction and maybe get some presenter who, um, who kind of like expert and comes from that, that field. It's not just legislative. Um, what I've heard is uh, things associated with uh, blockchain, uh, you know, putting uh, users' data in blockchain and how to handle that and wallets and so forth, which is fantastic, interesting, and, and I'd like to know more about it, actually. I don't know enough. Um, so uh, it's interesting that it moves from the ideation side, which was happening in the last few years, to uh, actualization and people actually implementing it. I, I wonder how it works and how it looks like. Um, that's it um, for, on my side. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone participating. It was wonderful to see you all, and, and I hope to see you again on our next meeting or sooner. So, thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Ray. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone.